most of the comments I got were from people who love wrestling or they, even if they don't love it, they totally appreciate the spectacle. Some of the ones who belittle it. Um, I'm just wondering about themselves um, when you're belittling things that other people find interesting or entertaining because you go naming the things that are fun about it. Or let's say I have to start naming what's fun about a superhero movie. I can't name one thing I'm enjoying that you can't then make the argument. Well, there's that in wrestling, too. Right. Like if you want to go watch a superhero movie and somebody said, why are you watching that? It's not real. And it's mm-hmm. like, OK, well, thank you for only watching Ken Burns documentaries your whole <laughs> life. And that's the only programming you can enjoy, because the reality is, is that most of the program we programming we do enjoy is fiction. And I think in today's world, wrestling fans and non-wrestling fans can understand that this is fiction. It is Yes, pre, it's not so much that it's predetermined, it is, but it's, it's scripted. You know there's a story that's being told. It's not a baseball game that's going to go nine innings. It's one of those things where I, I've been with my wife for 25 years, and she still does not understand why I like wrestling so much. She understands that I love it, that, uh, you know, all these other things. I think literally this week we had a conversation where she knows that that's my soothing is watching wrestling and going throwing it back to psychology, right? That it's, it's my self-soothing watching wrestling because it's something that takes me back to a comfortable place in my childhood and throughout my adulthood that I could always go back to that safe. And it is uh, good guys versus bad guys like any action movie. But again, we know that nobody's planned to die for real. When you watch a Tom Cruise movie, you know he's not going to die at the end because you would have already known that six months ago when they actually filmed it and he died off the plane, right? It's, it's that whole idea that, yes, you could follow this story, suspension of disbelief, and really enjoy it and cry at the end when uh, the ultimate warrior beats Hulk Hogan because I cried at the end when Hulk Hogan lost, right? It's because you can get that emotionally invested. And it, that's what's great about wrestling because you get so emotionally invested that uh, for those it's three hours, you just forget what else is going on, and it's fantastic. There is a difference between wrestling and superhero movies, and that's that you can't reboot wrestling. <laughs> like when you go and read a comic book, yeah. you're still we still get Steve Rogers Captain America, and yeah, they try some different things, but they go back to the same original superhero characters. And maybe if you're lucky, you get a Miles Morales that really connects with the audience rather than a Peter Parker. But wrestling's always got to move forward. As much as we love Undertaker or Sting, and they could, they're always having, they have a home with us. They do. But we always want to see the next stars make a name for themselves. And yeah, you can try to repeat history, but you can't change it. You can't restart it. When Hulk Hogan turned villain, well, even, even if he gets to redeem himself later on, that's always going to be in that history. And we're talking the character Hulk Hogan. Terry Bollea. Bollea. Uh, yeah, he, and he is different from Hulk Hogan, even though we'll refer to himself as Hulk Hogan in, in his own life. Hulk, uh, what Hogan knows best, he turned villain. That was news. Uh, Sergeant Slaughter going villain wasn't as big a news because he wasn't Hulk Hogan. My first awareness of Hulk Hogan was when he appeared as Thunderlips in the movie Rocky Three. And I think after that, he did become a much bigger known wrestler. Well, wrestling itself became bigger after that. I told Billy about this. My earliest memory of wrestling is Georgia Championship Wrestling on a weekend afternoon with a small audience that didn't seem all that enthusiastic. And it, it's, and we played it because nothing else was on, but still seemed kind of boring to us. Then the all these other these, these people with much more character come along. I think we just got the wrong wrestling channel because I would hear people talking about the more colorful ones. No, but it's so good because you have the old, old ladies in the front row. You know, you have the guy that uh, wants to fight the wrestlers because he does. they're beating up the good guy. So you have to jump in the ring and you have to hold that guy back. And there's just a little yellow rope holding everybody behind entering the ring, right? And when you're watching it, it was like this little rope. It wasn't this metal or any type of barrier. It was just a little rope. I used to love watching all that stuff. Like the more obscure wrestling I could find as a kid, the better, you know? And I'm not talking about even like Japanese or anything. It's being in San Diego and having cable and being able to find all, I guess, TBS, right? Watching uh, uh, WCW and NWA before that because it was on cable and not everybody had cable in the 80s. So it was cool to catch that and finding obscure wrestling. So 
Yeah, it's good to watch the, those regional shows because from there, that's where everybody would pluck the one guy that stood out and bring him up north to. Yeah, TBS yeah. had a whole lot to do with wrestling getting bigger in the 80s, I think. Not as much as in the 90s. Yeah. The in Monday the Night 90s, Wars. They almost put, took out uh, WWF because they had the Monday Night Wars. And that really led to that whole idea of Hulk Hogan turning heel, turning into a bad guy, turning into Hollywood Hulk Hogan with the NWO, with these guys that showed up from WWF who were the outsiders, right? And it's got Hulk, Kevin Nash. And it's like, wait, hold on. These guys are characters on the other show. What are they doing here on this show? And at that time, there's no internet. It's think of the Blur Witch Project, right? When you went to go see the Blur Witch Project in an indie theater because it hadn't gotten all this exposure yet, there were rumors that it was real, right? That's the most pro wrestling thing in the world, right? And there were rumors that it was real. I remember being, uh, I think it was at 96, 97 when that movie came out. <laughs> Going to watch it in Hillcrest here in San Diego because that's where the indie theater is. And they had a website, but nobody had the internet at home in our community. So we went and saw it and you walk out and you don't notice it when you walk in, but you walk out of the movie theater, there are all these handprints on the wall from children. And you're like, oh my God, this really, <laughs> like it, it, it works you into a shoot, if you will. And that's pro wrestling, right? It's the best wrestling show makes non-wrestling fans watch it and say, wait, was that real? My wife will do that. She still doesn't get it, but she'll watch it with me once in a while and go, is that real? Did that, is he really mad at him? Did he really <laughs> hit him? Sure, honey. It's still real to me. Well, I remember when they were finally kind of admitting that, yes, some of it's planned. Uh, and Mick Foley's biography was one of the things that uh, really got people to just, uh, we're just going to talk outright, sure, but it's still a show. Uh, there are two incidents. And I mean, we're, we're talking mainly about WWF slash WWE, uh, because that was kind of the big mainstay. Mm -hmm. For that, there were the territories, like Josue was saying, they would pick the talent from the territories. Nowadays, we kind of have a, a, a training center for WWE. There are still some independent shows. Two big events, and Mo, Josue, uh, there might be others that I'm not aware of that really broke the curtain of K-Tabe there. Uh, but the curtain call incident and the fact that a random fan brought a video cam to record it in the days when video cams were this big, I don't know how you sneak that into a studio or into a, a, an arena. It was like 95. Uh, it was, okay, so maybe it was like that small. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the curtain call incident. And then, um, you know, some would argue that was a butterfly effect into the most famous, for any wrestling fan who has ever read a dirt sheet, the most infamous event in wrestling history. Okay, so what was it? I got to ask as somebody completely ignorant. Everyone, let's say it on three, one, two, three, the Montreal, Montreal screw job. job. <laughs> oh, I've heard that. Yes, I've heard of that. Oh, there you go. Probably um, so you told me what it was now that I'm thinking about it, though. I think a couple of years ago, you were telling me about this Montreal screw job. I tell Beth, my wife, Bethany, every time I ask her if she wants to watch a wrestling documentary with me, whether it's, you know, one from YouTube that someone put together or something more professional like Dark Side of the Ring or anything on the WWE Network. Her first question is, is it about the Montreal screw job again? <laughs> I've heard her do that. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you had just been talking about it. She came up and she said that. That's right. He's not joking. Montreal screwjob again. <laughs> <laughs> there she is. Hi, Bethany. Hi, Travis. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Huh. I recently started to explain it to my wife, and she walked away. She was just like, <laughs> not doing it. I looked up a wiki on it after Billy was telling me about it. This was fascinating. It really is. Well, let's let's try to give Jonathan Wellinger a chance uh, with his question. Yes. Um, can you talk about the long-term injuries wrestlers sustain? I understand it's grueling on the body and mind. Is like there is there's real physical injury, and what is it like for them mentally? What do y'all know about these things or speculate on them? 
Well, well I, I have a co-host in Devon Dudley who back in November suffered a stroke. Mm -hmm. uh, and oh. he was pretty lucky. Like he admits he was lucky that he never really had a big major injury in his career. And he was in some tough matches, uh, a lot of weapons being used in his career. Uh, but the stroke brought him back down to earth, made him finally realize he was human. Like he got so used to the aches and pains, the bumps and bruises. He didn't think twice about it. That was life. But when he finally had something that rocked him to his core, then he had to realize, I don't know if I want to do this anymore. I, I don't know if I should. I don't know how I should proceed. And he actually went through a couple of weeks at least, maybe longer, for a guy that's getting to know him quite well. I think it lasted a couple of months of him really wondering about his future. There's a lot of uncertainty there because he had never experienced that. And I think when that's your livelihood, uh, for a couple of years or many years and a big injury happens to you, you really don't know if you're going to come back and you've put your heart and soul into it. What do you fall back on? First and foremost, uh, he doesn't know us, but please send him our love. Hopefully he's uh, recovering well. He's getting um, better. He's getting better. He's in good spirits again, but it, it was a long road. Yeah. And then you, you keep in mind back in the day, uh, nowadays, the the medical cannabis and whatnot is is better allowed and WWE is getting better and pro sports in general are getting better about allowing uh, their athletes to be able to unwind that way. But a lot of these stars that we talk about, the Hulk Hogan era or the NWO era, all they had were hard drugs and alcohol to get through things. And that's why you got so many bad stories and you had a lot of tempers and egos flare up because that's what they had to unwind. Uh, they, they, and a lot of them got addicted to painkillers because they live life beat up. So, uh, if there is one thing that's happening in pro wrestling these days, it is that it's cleaner than it used yeah. to be. And the lifestyle isn't as rock star as it used to be. Nowadays, most of the stars go backstage and play video games. And also the technology and medical care, right? For somebody like the undertaker, who's had a couple of hip replacements, right? And that it's that evolution of technology where somebody that is almost, you know, six, eight, six, nine, walking around with that weight and your hips and the years of athleticism, yeah, you're going to wear out. Uh, I know that uh, Kevin Nash, another big guy, he does a lot of stem cell, right, work where he's going down to Central South America to get uh, stem cell uh, work done. And a lot of wrestlers are following in that to get that, uh, get that uh, treatment done so that they can walk and they could not have to limp around because it is, I mean, it's, you could imagine that these guys' careers go beyond professional athletes, professional athletes. An old professional athlete is 32, 34, a professional wrestler is getting into his groove at 34, 36, the best professional wrestlers start really getting into their peak 38, 40. Right. And, and that's because they really understand the psychology of selling of the storytelling by that time. Not that I have to get that high spot. It's slow it down. And it's usually the more mature wrestlers that get that like an AJ styles this year, it's given all these guys. I feel like it extended a bunch of guys careers or, or just in general, because they had a break. They didn't have to travel. That's unique, right? It's, it's again, that idea of having a, a rock show. That's a traveling circus they don't have to do that this year. They're all wrestling in Florida, all of the comp major companies. So it's, it's adding years to their life or even the tour buses that they had going on before that versus driving from the town to town, the bigger the town, the more access they had. So it's, it's changing in those ways. And Billy's right. It's not as hard as it used to be right. Where not people aren't going out and some people still drink, but it's not like staying up all night, drinking all night, driving, drinking while you're driving to the next town. Like they used to tell the stories. Um, so it, I think that's giving longevity too. And they're actually checking for concussions now, which before you have a concussion, as long as you could walk, you could wrestle because you wouldn't get paid if you didn't work. Now they have guaranteed contracts. It's changed. It's evolved. So money's evolved too. You listen to the stories of these guys and girls and the traveling was a huge, huge part of the injuries because you're sitting in a car, you're immobile. Um, once you get to the next town, you got to find time to go to a gym. You don't have time to rest and ice up. Um, 
yeah, it, it's rough on the body and rough on the mind. And I think another big part of it, speaking of the mind, is when I've spoken to pro wrestlers, the attitude backstage has changed. Not, not to the point where it's happiness and rainbows, but back in the day, if you were injured, you would not tell your promoter because that meant you could lose your spot. And your spot and your ability to draw meant money to take care of your family. There were no sick days. There was get the job done, wake up the next day, do it again. And what has changed about that? Based on observation, what I've seen is that the companies have realized if we don't protect our talent, they could A, abscond to another, uh, um, another promotion, uh, a rival promotion. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, but also we can bring them back, especially if they get hot. Uh, John Cena has been pretty well protected. He can come back when he's 60. And if he's healthy enough, he can do a lot more spots uh, than Hulk Hogan would be able to. Um, a la the Shawn Michaels Hulk Hogan match, which is my one of my favorite matches of all times. Uh, I'm a huge mark for Shawn Michaels uh, and his antics in the ring. <laughs> I mean, you wouldn't see a hell in a cell like with Mick Foley and Undertaker anymore because that would have ended about three seconds in, right? As soon as he goes off the first, off, off the top of the, the cage the first time, they're not continuing. Now, before the attitude was a show must go on. Uh, Steve Austin right here, my buddy. Uh, he, uh, he, uh, he broke, they broke his neck and he was partially paralyzed in a match and he still finished the match. That's not happening today. They don't care what you say. He like does this roll up where he barely has his arm up. And he Travis, pins- your eyes just got super wide when he said that. <clears throat> it was, it was, it's great. And it's, and it's horrific to watch. And, and you watch that Mankind uh, Undertaker match and that's rough to watch. You watch that Steve Austin match with Owen Hart and that is just painful to watch because you know what happens. I mean, just see it and just see the guy, Steve Austin's neck just go crank and that's it. Like he, he dropped them the wrong way, but it's, it, that wouldn't continue today. I think there's two things that uh, also have really affected. And I want to specifically say the WWE product. Uh, first one that did affect more of an industry was the Chris Benoit incident, you know, with Chris Benoit, the murder suicide brought the dangers of pro wrestling to the forefront, regardless of how responsible the employers directly were his lifestyle led to, to to that 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 massacre that happened and around the same time you had the concussion protocol starting to change you had uh the what the uh Nowinski Institute or whatever that started opening up really looking at all of pro sports and concussions and i think that brought a lot of attention that WWE never really had to face before uh to explain why some of these stars don't get time off, that these stars don't get days off. Uh, so they had to change it for that. And then WWE also changed to PG, which PG-13 down to PG doesn't seem like a big deal. But when you are trying to cater to kids, mm-hmm. you also have to set that example of, you could say don't try it at home and then show the craziest things on screen, but you know kids will be kids. So you kind of want to teach them Okay, if you get hurt, you don't need to keep going. You're hurt. You will get help. And I think WWE really kind of had to follow the PG programming. That's interesting. A lot of PG showing more of the consequence of, of the harm. Well, also with the PG, um, there was a uh, an era called the Attitude Era in WWE where there, they were a lot more prone to doing something called blading. And I know Mo and Josue know what this is. For any of our audience members who don't know, it's how, and and Travis. um, (laughs) Red equals green, brother. (laughs) The, one of the questions, one of the, one of the questions you can ask a wrestler and have that wrestler instantly disrespect you and not have any respect for you is how do you get the fake blood look so real? Mm Mm-hmm. The way they do it uh, back in the old days and still these days, not so much on WWE, is they would take a razor blade or something sharp and they would hide it in their wristbands 
or in their waistbands or in their fingers uh, when they're taped up. And at a key point in the match, usually when the opponent is stealing the thun- or stealing the audience's attention, the spotlight. They would, yeah. Yep. There you go. They would do that. And if you look at pictures of uh, Abdullah the Butcher or Ric Flair's foreheads, mm-hmm. That's you, or New Jack, you will see. Or Devon Dudley. Yeah. Or Devon Dudley. Looks like a roadmap. Yeah. So what they do is run it across their foreheads, and then they would puff their cheeks. So and the opponent would also kind of, you know, kind of squish the wound, so the blood would flow. Yeah. And that's step. how they would do it. Aspirin too. And uh, aspirin, yes, the any sort of blood thinner. They don't allow that because of the new move to the PG. Now, every now and then you'll see blood, but that's because they do what's called hard way. Uh, hard way means you, uh, you get a wound, but you do it unintentionally. Like you actually busted your head open because you accidentally hit that ladder a little too hard with your head. Or uh, Cesaro a f- couple years ago, oh, painful. Uh, they kind of overshot him and they do that, uh, this... Mr. Slingshot Perfect was the best at it with a slingshot, right? And you overshoot the uh, the turnbuckle and you hit the corner. And he actually hit the corner with his teeth. And you just see him sink into his face because, well, there's only one way for your teeth to go out or in. And, you <laughs> in, and it was like painfully, I mean, just one of those things you never want to happen to you. And it's not planned. He wasn't supposed to go that far, but he just overshot it. And it's a bad calculation that leads to a funky, bad injury. I mean, it's not career ending, but it is just painful to watch. There's a lot of painful to watch in wrestling. Um, and, you know, I was going to say before I forget, especially for uh, somebody that's not in uh, like a novice with wrestling or doesn't understand wrestling, uh, there's a new show called Young Rock. If you haven't watched it, mm-hmm. it's uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, right? He's he's producing the show and he's, he stars in it. It's a phenomenal show. The choreography is by Chavo Guerrero, great wrestler. He did all of the uh, stunt work for Glow as well. So the wrestling is actually really good in the show, but it's a, not a show about wrestling. I think Major League, right, the movie where it's a show about baseball, but it's not really about baseball. There's mm-hmm. much more to it. And it, it tells a lot of the behind the scenes of wrestlers and wrestlers' lives because this is a child of a wrestler whose grandfather was a wrestler and grandmother was a wrestling promoter and he's just a little kid and Andre the Giant in his life and Macho Man and the Iron Sheik. And I mean, there's all of these characters in there that are fantastic because in real life they were characters and in wrestling they were characters. So it's, it's great to watch. It's actually really funny. It's really well done. And again, my wife who does not enjoy wrestling enjoys this show. So it, it's a good introduction to wrestling and how it works because there's a little, you know, wink from the wrestler in the ring to the son who's trying to impress the girlfriend And she's, you know, just like dying because they're beating this man and not understanding that it's a work. It's so good. I mean, I really recommend it. It's a funny show and it's easy to watch and it's a good intro to wrestling. I heard. I hope we get future seasons of the show. So uh, Billy's going to be able to introduce his uh, his wife to the uh, the Montreal screw job (laughs) via the rock's eyes. (laughs) She would kill me. She would shoot on me. People who watch modern wrestling now, we know it's a work. We know it's scripted. We know it's predetermined. Back then, people didn't know. And a lot of wrestlers would get attacked, stabbed, or shot at by audience members. Spit out, thrown urine at. uh, The further you get away from the mainland, the worse it got. It was very dangerous. You did have people that could have died and did get stabbed, did get shoes to rolls of quarters right i mean yeah stuff. Uh, it was, batteries people, people thought it was real right so i would say if if you're listening or watching this show and you still don't quite understand what the appeal of wrestling is you could watch it by yourself but find somebody in your life who does like mm. wrestling and sit down and watch it with them ask your questions because that's i think where a lot of distaste comes from is like why are they doing that and there's nobody to answer it for them. i mean like like starting a comic you got to start somewhere you don't know all of the character motivations and time you'd learn them but sit down with with somebody that gets it and, and go to a show if you can 
because then you'll understand. You'll get it. And we hate to say it, we told you so, but you'll be a fan. We told you so. As soon as, as, soon as I'm licensed. Yes. Right? But when you're licensed, you can be the, the something or other psychologist. You have something in the, the wrestling, the ring psychologist. The ring psychologist. That was it, the ring psychologist. Yeah. <laughs> Sway, uh the name of the agency under your name or something? Uh, or or know, just really type of therapist? Know. Director of <laughs> director of some agency. <laughs> director of too many things. Director uh, of too many things. It probably is fine. Yeah. That's, that's I like fine. that.